special welcome to Jeff Thompson, who I've had the pleasure of speaking to a number of times now, and it's always um, an insightful and interesting discussion we have. So thank you so much, Jeff, for coming on again. It's a pleasure. It's nice to see you again. <laughs> yeah, you too, definitely. So you've led, obviously, such an interesting life um, in terms of the self-defense realm, but also in terms of you know, just as a person and developing as a person from being kind of a scared child, as you've put it yourself, into facing those fears and trying to conquer those fears. And I think it's fair to say that from quite an early age, you were exposed to things that would make most people, most grown men, fearful. Um, so how how do you think you coped with that originally? And how do you think that transgressed into the person that you are now? I didn't cope with it like most people. And, uh, you know, I, I would... Uh, I can remember it the first time when I went to junior, to senior school, when I went up from that small little puddle of junior school where I was the kingpin. Mm -hmm. I played in goal for the school team. I was the girl's favourite, you know. Um, I was the one that led everything. I was kind of the top boy, I suppose. And then I went into the ocean of secondary school and I, was, I felt like I was drowning. Yeah. I, I, you know, they didn't recognise that I was special then. You know, they didn't know that I was somebody. Um, they just they just observed and saw what they saw. So I felt absolutely overwhelmed. But I think I also built built up too much for the senior school. I made too much of a big thing of it. And that's been yeah. a, quite, a, quite a big thing in my life, building something up to be bigger than what it is mm. um, and allowing my energy to be sapped by overexcitement. Obviously, as a kid, you don't know. Um, so I went to this new school where I wasn't recognised as the top boy. I was just one boy in, you know, in a playground full of, I don't know, maybe 30 other schools from all around the district coming together. And we were just we were just the first years. And there was, you know, there was kids above us five other years. There was kids in the playground, you know, nearly growing beards. It was yeah. I was nobody. Suddenly I was nobody. And I felt overwhelmed by that. So I felt I started to feel anxiety and fear and depression even at that age. And I, I would find myself go, I'm, I was brought up a Catholic um, and this was a Catholic school. I'd find myself going into the chapel um, and praying and begging God to take this feeling away from me. And ironically, <clears throat> um, 45 years later, <clears throat> I was in that same chapel talking to the kids, um, you know, about what they can do, what they can achieve. I went in with my BAFTA and my, you know, the things I'd accumulated, the things I'd won to do a talk for four, for uh, five groups of different uh, age school kids over a day. Um, and I ended up, they placed me in the chapel to do the talk. Yeah. And, uh, and, and that was the first time I, I understood why God had put me there. So when I was, when I was, 11 and 12 and feeling abandoned by God which has been another common theme in my life the feeling abandoned um, and saying take this off me he never took it off me it stayed there and I found a way through it eventually but when I went, went back to talk to the kids I suddenly knew exactly why why I was there and why I'd gone through that and what I was there to teach I was there to teach them about the boundaries of fear about understanding fear, about understanding the body chemistry, about understanding how we need to uh, learn to get a control of the endocrine system if we're going to achieve anything in this life other than the ordinary mundane. Because if we haven't got control of our endocrine system, somebody else has got control of it. So an advert or a <coughs> poster or a, an unkind email or an unkind message can hook us like a fish and drag us, you know, the populace are, are, are dragged in all sorts of direction, um, you know, by what they hear on the television. I mean, the world is full of fear at the moment. The world is touch sensitive because of the things that are going on. So people are herded in all sorts of um, unholy directions because of fear, not just because of fear, but because of the passions, because of desire, um, you know, because of um, uh, any kind of arousal. So we have to get some kind of control of our endocrine system. We have to win our will back. That's the kingdom. When you talk about seek the kingdom, seek the kingdom of God in his righteousness, he's talking about 
find the will, win the will. In, in the Old Testament, they talk a lot about enter the land, the promised land, the land of milk and honey. And it's this promised place at the end of our um, journey, our kind of hero's journey. But the word land find its root, finds its root in will, in the word will. So when it's saying find the land, it's saying win your will back. Find your will and win it. The will is an attribute, as is intelligence, of the soul. So we use our will and our intelligence, or the soul uses our will and our intelligence to um, create in the manifest world. If we haven't got control of that, we're, we're not in control of the kingdom. We haven't, this body with its trillions and trillions of cells and its limitless potential, because we have, we do have the gift of causation. We can, we, we have the ability to cause things and create things. Um, but of course we don't do them because we haven't got control of the will. So when I went back into the school, uh, you know, to talk to the kids, that's what I talked to them about. You know, I said, you've got control of your will. If you haven't got control of it, somebody else has got control of it and they will manipulate that. Yep. Even if they don't even know that, I mean, there are obviously a lot of people in the world who do know that how to manipulate the will and they do manipulate the will with as little as a clickbait, you know. Yeah. This, this massive planet of cells can be hooked by a tiny, you know, image of a breast or, yeah. or an ankle or a bottom or, or, or a violent arousal and people are boom. They think they've got control, they think they've got power, but they're pulled down, they're pulled down the rabbit hole by... Um, you know, by as little as a tiny clickbait like that. So, um, so for me, it was it was recognizing that I had to get some control of that. Yeah. So we're not really controlled by the world. We're controlled by our endocrine system. We're not afraid of the world. We're afraid of the reaction to the world in our endocrine system. We're not afraid of things. The fear is the perception because we have we have a fear of our own body chemistry. Our body goes into fight and fight or flight, and we have this innate thousands and thousands of years instinct to run away or to fight or yeah. to freeze. So it's learning to control that so you can go, uh, yeah, well, I, you know, in this situation, I don't need to run away. In this situation, it's not appropriate to run away. It's certainly not appropriate to freeze. I've got a speech to deliver. Um, it's not appropriate to fight. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm living in, supposed to be living in a civilized world. I can't bang everybody because they disagree with me. But I did go through a long period of freezing. Then I went through a long period of banging everybody that disagreed with me. <laughs> um, until you find a way to, to create this homeostasis or this arc, this center point, um, and sit inside it and you know, be an observer of all the passions, but not be, you know, so you're watching the storm from in the eye wall, but you're not part of the storm. Do you and think course, it's necessary yeah. to go through those stages then? To go through the freeze stage perhaps, and then go through the fighting stage to ultimately I think so. achieve the, the kind of, yeah. as you said, the homeostasis? I do think so. I, I, <laughs> I, and for me, I, I had to go out into the world to do that. Yeah. Someone asked me a question this morning uh, on my Instagram page about, do you think you need to confront the things you fear in order to overcome them? Well, actually, they only exist in you. They don't exist as a separate entity. Yeah. You know? It's just, a, it's just a, um, a perception of something um, yeah. that we give, we, give a, we give form and aspect. So if I have a perception of you as being aggressive, creates a form of an aggressive person with an aspect that is going to be aggressive towards me. But that's really just a perception. Yeah, well, what I'm able to let that go. May again, someone, what one person finds aggressive, someone else may not find aggressive. For example, yeah. It's so ultimately, it's about experience. Yeah, so it's about controlling what's in you. It's about going to going to war with your own concepts, with your own precepts, with your own perceptions, with the cognitions, the little bags of knowledge we've built up. You know, um, and if they're not right, if our if our internal parent, you know our super ego isn't right if it's built up of um false material then we can start to work and change that but all of these thought forms of concept and a precept um and a cognition they're, they're semi-autonomous life forms that live inside of us you know and a lot of them won't go without a fight we want to get rid of that 
uh, a, you know that um, perception of aggression or that perception of you know the, we, that we it's a dog eat dog world and or whatever the perception is we've got a perception that that's we've inherited maybe it's thousands of years old maybe we've learned it from people that we absolutely don't want to challenge because we love them maybe our teacher taught us it maybe it's the way our dad lives or our mum so when we come to remove that because it's no longer it's no longer um, tenable in the world we see it puts up a fight. So that's in, in is, Islam, they call it uh, the greater jihad, the greater war. Yeah. So the greater war is not when we roll up our sleeves and try and fix things out there. It's when we go inside and fix it from the centre. We go into the very, very centre. But, but that is, um, you know, that's, that's a job on its own. That's a big job. It's the only job, really, because all the stuff we see out there, you know, it's... Um, Everything has a denotation. Yeah. But other than if you take the denotation away, it's, it's just lots and lots of energy forms that have um, that have the same signature, um, and they're only fearful or pleasurable because we've given them a can't we've given them a name. So if we're able to free ourselves from denotation. To paraphrase the Buddha, um, you know, our conscious net expands. We become we we get a clear view. So. Buddha said to one of his students, freed from denotation, I am, by consciousness. So awareness freed him from the need to label everything and go, that's this and it's fearful, that's this and it's pleasurable. That's, um, you know, like the amount of people that are out there now going, I've got to have this car, I've yeah. got to have that holiday, I've got to win that award, I've got to have this validation. Uh, it's, just, it's just things that we... we um, put a label on and then we give them power by believing the label so the idea is to challenge the labels to get rid of the labels to be free from denotation to expand to use consciousness or awareness to free ourselves from denotation it's difficult like um krishnamurti said you know we're not dealing with um you know the, end the endocrine system isn't 61 years old you know it's like it's, it's as old as the species. It's yeah. you know tens of thousands, maybe millions of years old. So we're not fighting a sixty-year-old battle with with a sixty-year-old concept. We're fighting the battle with our genetic inheritance, <clears throat> with our learned inheritance. You know, with our uh, so it might it might be thousands of years old and mature. And you're saying you're out, you're gone, you are a squatter. You you've served me for a while. You maybe you kept me alive for a while, but this. And this part of my evolution I need to let you go I need to convert you <clears throat> so um it all comes down to the endocrine system it all comes down to the control of the endocrine system and the ability or or the yeah i guess you would say it's the ability to be the, the what's the word i'm thinking about the It's not minding being uncomfortable, you know. Right. It's we, we have to be prepared to be uncomfortable. We're not we're not going to overcome the endocrine system without going very deeply into the endocrine system. Pushing so yourself uh, out your comfort zone and yeah. So yeah. you've got to be prepared to feel those feelings because those feelings are the entryway to consciousness. Yeah. So we have to follow the feelings back like bubbles from a puncher in an inner tube. We have to follow the bubbles back to the genesis and enter that small, tiny hole and go into consciousness. So we have to, in order to become disentangled from fear, we have to, we have to entangle ourselves more. This yeah. is, uh, I'm paraphrasing quantum entanglement, which I don't, I don't know much about quantum, but I understand entanglement <clears throat> is, you know, when we get, we get entangled with concepts and precepts, we get entangled with feelings and thoughts and beliefs. Um, and the way to uh, the way to overcome that entanglement is to go deeper into it. In other words, to go to the genesis of it and then go beyond it, because everything has a genesis somewhere. Mm. So if we go right the way to the very center and break through it, we break free from denotation. So, but to do that, you have to be prepared to sit in the fear. You have to be prepared to be uncomfortable, to experience you know, the adrenal dump, you have to, to experience the slow drip, drip of anxiety and sit in it and, and question it and say, what is this feeling? Yeah. What is it? When I, when I um, engage it and I, I emotionally identify with it, 
this feeling has a whole rack of you know future projections that terrify me but if i'm able to just sit in the feeling and not engage it it might sit there for a little while because it has it has a bit of momentum but if i just sit in the feeling and just observe it go deeper and deeper into it and call it forward and ask for more invite it in um at some point it will dissipate because it hasn't it hasn't it's only got a small battery yeah. it isn't attached to anything it's not real so if we're able to sit in it we're able to break it so if 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 our world is a map then fear marks the spot where the treasure is so we have to be prepared to go into that feeling and that's what most people don't want to do they want to they want to forge you know um tungsten soul so that they can connect negative and positive elements or terminals and create light but they don't want to they don't want to do what tungsten does which is it goes through a process of burning and heat and fire and torment yeah. before it before it reaches that very very high burning point so people want you know to use a common phrase or phraseology they want to make an omelet but they don't want to break any eggs yeah. what they want to be they want to be a tempered blade, but they don't want to go through the forge and the hammering. And I understand that because I've, you know, I've avoided it nearly all my life. Till I, you know, till I suffered with these depressions and decided um, this isn't working for me. So instead of running away from these feelings <clears throat> and seeing them as a harbinger of doom, maybe I should turn into them and yeah. intercourse with them and absorb them. The Ushiba Ushiba talked about absorbing 99% of the fear before it would give up its tendency, before it give up its secrets. And we're talking about a man that stood trembling in front of a firing squad, squad when he was training with the prophet Dibuchi uh, uh, Anusabura, or Anusabura Dibuchi, whichever way you want to put it. So, you know, you're talking about a man who went out into the world and, and really experimented with this. Yeah. Um, and... Uh, you know, so most people don't want to absorb 99% of fear in order to see its secrets. But if we can look at it and go, what is this feeling? If we can inject curiosity, fear loses its grip very quickly. I'm not saying it's not challenging because it really still is, but it loses its grip much quicker when we go, oh, here's that feeling again. Let's have a look at it. Let's be guinea pig A in our own life and see what we can do with this. Let's see what we can make with this. Yeah. Let's see how long it let's see how long it lasts, how long it sits in my body if I don't engage it and project to the future <clears throat> or regress to the past. Because once we engage it and identify with it, of course, um, we incarnate it. We be, it becomes us. So the feeling that rises up or the feeling that approaches, um, when we engage it and identify with it, because that's what we're used to doing. Um, we engage it and we give it life. It becomes we become incarnated by that feeling. So we're no longer <clears throat> feeling fear. We are fear. We're no longer feeling aroused. We are arousal. We're no longer feeling threatened. You know, we are the threat is living in us as a parasite. Yeah. So we give it life, but we can also deny it life. It can't cross the threshold without our permission. Mm. <clears throat> but first of all, most people don't know that. They don't understand that concept. They don't understand that thoughts, um, all, the, all these thought forms, aren't in us. They may have hubs in us. They may have locations in us where they, where they dock, but they, you know, they come from outside and we can block them. We can stop them from entering by not engaging them, by not identifying with them. <clears throat> if you watch a very strong arousal, fear or sexual arousal particularly, because they're probably the strongest arousals we get, you'll, you'll recognise that they might, they might start in your head, they might start in your toes, they might start in your belly, but they will always, they will always make their way up to the, pl the plender gap here. Right. This is the doorway. This is what they call uh, the doorway to the heart. The, the heart is an allegory for the will. So this is the doorway, doorway to the will. <clears throat> so as a geographical point on our body, in our biology, so all those passions rise up, this is the only doorway into the nightclub. They don't enter through any other doorway. They might, they might alight into the places, but it always finds its way to here. Mm. So if we can guard that doorway, if we can watch that doorway, we're able to watch those emotions. That, that, but they, you know, 
the feeling of adrenaline might may still be in us. It may still be infused in our own body because you know it's it's found enough entry point to trigger the adrenals. Um, so we may have our body full of anxiety, but we haven't engaged it. And if we're able to sit in it and keep watching it, you will eventually hear it. It will, it will develop a voice. It will talk to you. It will scream at you. Um, and if you just keep watching it, it will dissipate. It will go back to where it came from. It will rise and it will fall again. But we have to have the courage to sit in it and stay in it, whatever that fear is. Um, and if you're going to do something important, like um, we did the film about forgiveness, tremendous, tremendous opposition to stop me from doing that film. Tremendous, because we're talking about the metaphysical power of forgiveness. And what we're talking about when we're talking about forgiveness, we're talking about removing the parasite of hate. That's what we're doing, nothing more. We're removing the parasite of hate, a concept, a precept, an anger, a dissonance, a, a fear, a wound, we're, we're removing it <clears throat> and we're kicking out the squatter. So of course this parasite, <clears throat> excuse me, um, this parasite is, is just a parasite that is attached to a greater parasite. So if you call it a pain body, again, to quote Eckhart Tolle, so we've got a pain body that's existing inside us and it feeds off pain. But this pain body connects to the, what Eckhart Tolle would call the world pain body. So there is a greater energy around us that will dock with that, alight with that vibration and work through us <clears throat> and literally feed off our human emotions, especially anger and fear, sexual arousal, you know, terror. It literally feeds off the energy of the, of the human essence, feeds off the soul. So the idea is that we, um, we recognize this and we guard the doorway to the heart, the doorway to the will. Because what happens when we follow the trick, the, the, the clickbait, Dan, is that, uh, you know, our will is taken off us. Yeah. You know, you know we, our will is taken off us because we feel fear um, or we feel arousal and suddenly we're reacting. We get, we're actioning it in the world. And the moment we action it in the world, we create karma. We, 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 we are a cause to an effect. And the effect becomes a cause to another effect. So we, we create children that create children that create children. And that will keep expanding until it meets a greater force. Until it, you know, until actually it can only be stopped by a greater force. And that greater force would be uh, love. Mm. Or just neutrality. So we just sit and watch it. So the idea is that this, we are tricked into arousal. <clears throat> we think, we speak, we act, we create karma. And then that karma goes out into the world and works as a spirit. It works as a living energy, as a semi-autonomous thought form that will go in other people. If we're doing it from the right position, from a righteous or from a, an aligned position, righteous just means the right path. And we're, like we're talking now, we're talking from a place of inspiration. We're sharing a common goal because we want to serve people. Mm -hmm. We want to help people. We want to pull the depressed kid out of bed. We want to inspire the kid who's, who's uh, uninspired, you know. We want to encourage the person who's fearful. So we're doing it through this podcast. What we're doing is we're, we're using the same process, we're, we're, but we are releasing good karma, you know. Yeah. So we, we are creating a good cause. And it's not just like, oh, you know, he said a nice thing. That's really nice. You create a good cause, and that, that can and will last forever, yeah. you know, especially if you've got a platform. So we're creating a good course. So we're releasing breath or spirit um, or the Holy Ghost or the Holy Dove, the, um, the paraclete, as they call it in Christian theology. So we're releasing. Uh, so if, if you've got God as the father and Christ as the word, uh, then the, the spirit is the breath. So when we speak, we literally release breath that goes out and infuses people, inspires them. And so we, we are creating a living semi-autonomous energy that will um, act as a healing agent for people. Yeah. So we're learning to do the same thing. We can't do that if we haven't won our will back. Mm. So we have to capture our will. This is like um, Odysseus when he comes back from the Trojan Wars um, to his home in Ithaca and finds that his kingdom has been overrun by vagabonds. His wife doesn't recognize him. His, his servants don't recognize him. 
um, and he's got to go to war to win his kingdom back. It's a great allergy about, uh, allegory about a man that wakes up. He stops warring with the world <clears throat> and he wakes up to his own consciousness and recognises that, that he, he is the sovereign within this amazing kingdom. But he, he's not got sovereignty over it, even though he is the legitimate king. It's been taken over by egoic forces, by demonic forces. So it's saying when we wake up, it's not just like, oh, you know, Jeff Thompson's woke up. Fantastic. He's floating. It's not. It's like I've woke up and I've realized that I have no control over the territories in my own body. <clears throat> I've no control over my passions, over my endocrine system. I've no control over <clears throat> my beliefs. So I've got to go to war to win those territories back one at a time. Yeah. So it's um so it's a matter of winning the will back. And that means <clears throat> that can be as little as getting out of bed in the morning to meditate. Yeah. The big things are like eating healthy, not filling our mind full of the propaganda that comes through the television screen yeah. every single night. And it's so blatant, it's more insulting than a cigarette packet. <laughs> Yeah. The cigarette packet says, oh, I'm going to charge you six quid or whatever it is for a packet of cigarettes. And here's some pictures of what it's going to do to your lungs. It's like it's like the devil had an argument with God and said, I'll tell you what I can do. I can not only can I get stupid people. To buy these cigarettes and smoke them, I'm going to show them the photographs of what it will do to them, the agony it will bring to them, the agony it will bring to their children. And they're still going to want to run to the shops to buy it. Yeah. So that's what that's what happens in society. We see corrupt politicians who are charming, but openly corrupt. This isn't a judgment. This is I'm not a political kind of person. I'm just saying what I see. Yeah. So we've got openly corrupt people, openly narcissistic people, openly, openly selfish people, openly greedy people um, coming through our television screen every night. <clears throat> and we can see they're openly yeah. uh, corrupt. And, and we're supposed to take advice from them. Why would we do that? That's like, that's like looking at a cigarette packet and going, yeah, I know that's going to do all those things. I'm just going to take my chances. Yeah, so when you start looking at the corruption in the world, you start coming back to yourself and think, OK, those corruptions are in me. They're in me. That corrupt politician is in me. I've got elements of that. I've definitely got fundamental you know, violent tendencies in me because I was a bouncer for 10 years and I kicked people's heads in because I was so insecure. And I've definitely got that greedy element in me. So it's a, it's a quiet conceit for us to just go, the world is corrupt, what are we going to do about it? Actually, you're corrupt, what are you going to do about that? Mm -hmm. You've got to go back in and you've got to win your will back from those territories. So you've got to win your integrity back, got to win your morality back. You've got to look at the riches that the world is promising and realise it's folly. It's none of it's real. None of it means anything. So someone gives you an award. Oh, wow. But, you know, most of them, if you look closely, if you go behind the curtain, why would you want awards from these people? They're not even meeting their own standards. Yeah. And if they if you take the award and you believe it, it's not so much taking it because we can use these things to open doors in the manifest world. But if we if we believe it, we are their prisoner because suddenly they give you a award and then next thing you know they're dictating the way you write your film or the way you present your work because you know you're afraid you're afraid you, they'll take the award off you or you're afraid that you won't win it again mm -hmm. so all of this validation all of this claim it, it means nothing other than the fact that once we get it we realize it's not real it might we may be able to use it it can have a purpose we can use anything but if we believe it we're in the ship so ultimately we have to find it an inner validation we have to go to the one place within us, and it is within us, where the, the, it's the only validation that counts. The validation of the world means nothing. The applause of the world means nothing. You know, the money in the world doesn't even exist. Mm. You know, there's no money. There isn't money. There is, there is just a promissory note. Yeah. It's not even, it isn't even attached to, you know, gold bullion or, or capital anymore. It's just, it's just made up numbers. It's just the world is working on a big promise. Yeah. You know, it's, so and when we start to look at, I mean, that, you know, you find that out just by, just by having two hours on Google, just putting what is money. And very, very quickly, you will see your, your, your model of the world shift because you'll go, fucking hell, 
money doesn't even exist, but it exists enough as a concept for people to kill for it. Yes, yeah, people to for it. Needed. Yeah. So it's um to cut up, you know, um, I've elaborated, but really it's coming back down to winning your will back. Mm. That is the kingdom. That's the fabled kingdom. And all of the books, if you go beyond the revealed Bibles, the revealed Bible is the one that people go, fucking hell. What, the world was created 4,000 years ago in seven days. That's rubbish. Put that down. That's the revealed Bible. When you go to the hidden Bible and you go in beyond that and you go to what the, what the parables mean and the stories mean, um, and even beyond that, to the exegesis, to the explanation of the explanation of the explanation, it's another world. The Easter Cherubic is completely different. So the hidden Bibles contain all this. But what do you have to do to sit and read the Bible? You have to be able to master your will because it is so rich and it's so dense and it's so full of house ghosts. that most people will pick it up and go, I can't, I can't digest this. I can't sit and read this. You have to have complete mastery of your will to be able to go through those books in order to, to find the revealed Bible. So we have to win our will back before we can do anything. That's why I always say I don't concern myself too much about the economies of the world if I can't even manage my own waistline. Yeah, yeah, true. Yeah, yeah. It's so um, and, yeah. yeah, so it's coming back to the self, which is good because it means I haven't, got to, I haven't got to fix the world. The world, the world is whack -mole. You know, we all know that the yeah. problems, the problems that were always there are always here. They yeah. Just changed hats. But we can change ourselves. And when we change ourselves, the manifest world starts to change as well. But again, I don't want to make this. I don't want this to sound like I'm saying it's easy. I'm saying I struggle with it every day because when those feelings rush in, there's thousands of years worth of heritage and, hit, and um, lineage sorry, there that's saying you need to run. Yeah. You need to get rid of this feeling. Um, but what my intuition is saying is when you sit down with Dan this morning, if you've got anxiety that's rising up and it doesn't seem to have any purpose, you will, in the volition of doing an interview, you will consume that energy and create something beautiful from it. Yeah. This, will be a, this will be something that will go out and it will talk to people. Yeah. And it will act inside them as an agent as a positive agent because it's coming from a place of truth and it's coming from a place of love and the intention is honorable. So that energy that um, sits there and feels like anxiety is suddenly can be got, you got the, the positive um, terminal and the negative, the positive terminal that said, I need to create something. The negative terminal saying, we just want to sit on our ass and do nothing. Mm. And then you put your will in between that, like a filament, um, like a tungsten filament, and it creates the it creates an arc of light. Yeah. So the the soul it's the soul itself has to burn in order to heal. It has to burn in order to create light. Um, but not many people want to experience burning in order to create light. Yeah, definitely. And why do you think then that you chose the doors as your vehicle to to that kind of getting the will back to to going through the fire? I suppose why was it why was it door work that especially what was the the catalyst for that i think it was uh because i was i think i was um a first down in karate at the time in shotokan it was a tough yeah. system it was kugb so they were renowned for tough gradings it was a you know we, we were working with legends terry o'neill and bob point and andy sherry and um you know frank brennan and uh you know ronnie christopher these amazing amazing yeah. people so it's a very tough system and I was the first time in it, um, and I was supposed to be, you know, I was a teacher, but I was just still scared all the time. I was scared of my own biology, my own endocrine system. So I think the door was a natural outlet for me because I, um, because I was supposed to be a fighter, but I was afraid of fighting. I wasn't afraid of fighting. I was afraid of, I didn't really know what worked for yeah. a start off. So that, that creates a lot of fear because you just don't really know. And the first time you get a confrontation, your you get adrenal dump and your instinct is saying run 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 um or freeze and and then you're sat there afterwards thinking with the black dog thinking i should have said this i should have done that i was a coward you know why did i i'm a black belt you know the fact that you're a black belt makes it even worse because you because your instincts 
overrode that and said, we don't give a fuck about the black belt. This is about survival. This is a saber-toothed tiger. You've got to run away and survive. Um, so, you, you know, because you don't understand that, you just think, oh, I'm a coward. And then, of course, that becomes an internal monologue. And you, you know, you feel fearful. You feel more fearful. For me, I turned into it. I thought, well, you know, if, if, if running away from fear isn't making it better, it's making it worse, then I need to turn into fear. And the need to try and find a different way of doing this. And the moment I started to turn into fear and absorb fear, 99% of it, to quote Ushi, by literally picking up a spider, literally going to the dentist, literally entering a big karate tournament, all the things I was yeah. afraid of, but didn't, I was even too afraid to admit I was afraid. I would just say, it's not that I'm afraid. I just don't want to do it. But I was afraid, you know, I was afraid of, I, you know, I couldn't fight the tide in the bath. You know, my, my, the moment my adrenal, adrenaline came in, I was wiped out and people could use that against me. I was afraid of my wife. I was afraid of my mother. I was afraid of change at work. Um, so the idea for me was that, first of all, I don't know what works. I'm a black belt and I'm teaching and, I'm, and I'm, I've got something in me that wants to understand the truth. Yeah. And I've got all of these gods around me telling me what the truth is, but it, but it doesn't smell of the truth to me, Dan. You know what I mean? It doesn't smell like truth. It smells like they believe it, but it doesn't smell like truth yeah. to me. There's a dishonesty there. And I'm looking quietly at the people who are teaching this, and they're not living morally. They're teaching Budo. And again, this is in no way meant as a judgment, but I just wanted to observe what I was seeing. You know, people not paying their tax, keeping their money under a biscuit, in a biscuit tin under the bed, having affairs with their students, you know, you know and uh, living immorally. But, but in a, on a, working from a stance of Budo, this is honourable. We're bowing in and out of the room. We're bowing to the room, but we're fucking our students. We're bowing to the room, but we're fiddling our tax. We're bowing to the room, but we're lying to our wife, to our husband. We are bowing to the room, but we're abusing our children when we, you know, run off with the neighbor's wife and leave them without anybody, you know, they're, they're wounded by it. it so it's this, I, I noticed that I saw, I saw that, but I didn't want to see it now because I love these people. You know, they were, they were gods, you know, when they, you know, when they put their foot out to do a kick or, you know, they, they were just like, you know, but if you questioned them, I watched a couple of people question them about stuff and they got battered, mm. they got battered in, in the gym, you know, and you just go, well, that's the way it is. It's Japanese, isn't it? You know, we don't play around with it. We don't question the instructor. But actually, again, I, the, my biggest fear was that I would be judging them. And that's not where I want to be because judgment is, is, as, judgment is as bad as the thing we're judging. But you can object, objectively look at something and think that's not aligning. There's not a congruence there. There's actually no power there because there's no congruence. This isn't connected to spirit. It's not correct connected to Budo. This is just a physical and psychological thing. Yeah. It's a manipulation. There's no power. It's, it's temporal. It isn't connected to anything eternal. And I, I could, although I couldn't articulate it, I could see it. Even as a 15-year-old standing in a pub watching a fight kick off, I knew what we had would not work in that environment. It just wouldn't. I knew it. But the moment I thought it, this other voice said, shut up. Who do you think you are? Mm. You're a snotty little purple belt. You don't know anything. And if I questioned the teachers later on, they would, I'd say, what about the grappling? What, 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 shouldn't we put some grappling in here? Because what if I make a mistake and I get grabbed? Don't make a mistake. I said, yeah, but monkeys fall out of trees. People make mistakes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but you've got to get so good that you don't make a mistake. I said, but, you know, it feels like there's a whole area that we're missing. I said, and I can see in the kata. I can see all those grappling moves in the kata, but we're not actually practicing them because you're saying we don't need them. But I, but I think we may, maybe we do need to, you know, square the circle. Maybe we do need to look at all those areas. Because if you until you've completed the physical, you can't really, you can't really start to master the psychological. And until you've mastered the psychological, you're not, you are not going to spill into the metaphysical. Mm. So we have to try and round off all the corners. So I had to kind of go against you know, um, all of the gods and all the people I loved and find my own way. And I realized that uh, 
they were lying, but it wasn't that they didn't, it wasn't that they weren't telling the truth because they believed what they were saying, but what they were yeah. saying wasn't true. It was what you maybe would call an interim truth. And then, and then I looked at it and thought, I was really inspired by the idea of Budo, you know, like Funakashi and, yeah. uh, you know, Kano and people like Ushiba, especially Ushiba. Mm. I love the way they lived and I love the challenges they made to what other people were thinking. And it went way beyond what I was learning, but I wasn't seeing that around me. Um, and I wasn't seeing people living morally, even in church. I'd sit in church and I'd look around and think, none of these people are living this. And then I'd reprimand, reprimand myself for judging them. But I just thought, it's not that, that you, know, everybody's, you know, everybody's where they need to be, but you've got to look at where there's an incongruence. Yeah. If there's an incongruence, it means we're not connected. Incongruence mean, means everything needs to be aligned. Yeah. So we align the physical, the psychological, and the metaphysical. Um, and if they're not aligned, we're not, you know, we're, we're, um, we haven't got the plug in the mains electric. And you can, you, you know, you can switch your machines on all day long, but if you're not plugged in, you're not plugged in. Mm -hmm. We can tell, say we're plugged in, and we can pretend we're plugged in. We might have a little bit of battery power, but we're not plugged into the mains electric. So congruence means that the lead is in and pressed into the wall. It's either pressed in or it's not pressed in. If it's just a bit pressed in, it's not connected. You know, and if it's sat down on the floor by the plug, it could, it could be a half an inch away, it's still not connected. So I was interested in congruence. So I became a bouncer, first of all, to find out what did work. Yeah. Um, and to understand, you know, I'd built myself up by climbing my fear pyramid so that I could um, control my endocrine system and my fear to a degree, you know, where I could do the things I was afraid to do. And this meant I was changing jobs. I'd left the, the safe, comfortable job and I was going out and doing other jobs. Um, I'd started to stand up for myself at home. I'd started, you know, I got this bit of um, kind of hardiness about me. Um, so I just thought I'd become a doorman, first of all, to test my concepts on control of fear. Yep. Um, and also um, to find out what works. And I have this idea that somebody on the door might teach me or, or, you know, or that um, I certainly get, I certainly get to test my theory on managing fear. But I realized when I went on the door that there wasn't any one person that really taught me. Although I'd got people there that I mirrored, there was an egregore when I went on the door. There was an environment. There, yeah. was, there was a being that surrounded the environment that was a collection of all its parts, but it was greater than the sum of its parts. So there was literally, uh, there was literally, a, an energy that taught you. So the environment taught me what worked. What didn't work fell away like a cheap suit. It didn't care about hierarchy, didn't care about dams. It didn't care about offending people. It ju you just went in. It was a heat that stripped away everything that wasn't real. Mm. And so the environment taught you exactly what worked, but it would demand that you let go of everything that didn't work. You know, it didn't tolerate. It didn't tolerate anything. All the all the dross was burned off, and you just left with the gold. Yeah. So it didn't tolerate what didn't work. People that went in there and tried to hold on to their their false truths got battered. Even really accomplished people got battered. Some of them got killed. So I had, I had to be prepared to let go of everything I've been taught, and just let the environment teach me what what would work within that environment. So I started to listen to the environment. It wasn't until many years later that I understood the concept of an egregore and that any kind of corporation, any kind of collection of people who have a like-minded um, aim will create an energy that will, that will be greater than the sum of its parts and the, the environment will teach us, for good or for bad. Yeah. You now, everything I learned on the door, you, know, you could say that the environment was neutral. It was just saying, this is what's going to work in this environment. Um, the consequences of it are yours. But then ultimately, when I started to go beyond the physical, <clears throat> and I got prolific and proficient at the physical to the point where I was scared to use it because it was so uh, potent. Yeah. It was so potent that I was afraid to do it um, to the point where I started to pull all my punches because I was knocking everybody out. And that, that, was, that meant... Uh, Faces hitting the pavement, yeah. teeth being separated from gums, all the blood, 
yeah. crying girlfriends, you know, um, people f- very afraid of you. Um, so it meant all of those things. It meant the, um, the karmic debt, you know, that all, of the, that all of that violence is in your plumbing, you know, it's there. You can't get rid of it until you atone it. Um, and of course, you know, the, the consequences of, you know, the, the aftermath of mm. comebacks, the law and all the rest of it. There's a whole environment. So I started to learn about what the environment, what, what, uh, what causation meant. 